It is a scam when you don't allow everyone to operate on fair terms. We are the Robin Hoods of sports betting. We take something back from the rich bookies and enable our customers to beat them instead. Hi guys, Alex here. Welcome to episode 69 of the Trademate Sports Betting Podcast. Today I'm joined by former Canby odds compiler for both horses and greyhounds, Jonathan Mullen. Welcome to the podcast, mate. Hi, mate. Thank you for having me. Uh, looks Looking very summery there in your sun cap and t-shirt while I'm freezing <laughs> over here. But, uh, yeah, such is life. Yeah, I mean, I, I get lots of shit for wearing the sun cap, but uh, it's mostly just because I just have shit hair a lot of the time. You know, it's only seven o'clock in the morning here, haven't even had a shower. So it's, um, you know, I've got to put the cap on or I've got just that terrible bed hair. <laughs> Nine at night here, so I'm straight to bed after this. <laughs> exactly, mate, exactly. We're uh, we're doing our best. We're working at all sorts of hours here, but we'll... Uh, We'll try to get some good stuff today. Um, so, mate, obviously, spend a bit of time. You're not working for Canby at the moment, but you're used to. Um, I thought we could just start off there, kind of your journey from, I don't know, whenever you started uh, getting into horses to to working for Canby in the racing industry. I first got into racing when I was very, very young. Um, it was through my granddad, principally. Um, he... He he yeah he's he'd have his bets on a Saturday. Um, I'd be in the house, take some interest in what he was doing, um, and um, I always had quite a good memory, so um, I was quite a sponge for information. Picked it all up very quickly, um, but I suppose at a young age, uh, yeah, I grew up in Liverpool, uh, which is a, a big city, and obviously football is a massive thing there. Um, when I was growing up, I di I didn't really see or know of any opportunities in racing. Um, so it wasn't something that really crossed my mind. Uh, so I went through primary school, secondary school, um, not really considering that, that working in racing or betting for that matter, because it's not something that crosses your mind when you're a young kid, um, would be possible. Uh, went to university, studied Spanish and French, um, part of which I spent a year abroad, then finished university, still didn't really know what I was going to do um, and decided that I was going to move back to Spain for a bit. But just before I went, I saw an advert for the British Horse Racing Authority Graduate Development Program. And it was too late for me to apply that year. And I'd already taken a position in Spain anyway. But I thought, well, next year, I'm, I'm going to go for that. Uh, so I did. Uh, the following year, I went for that and I got on the program. Um, I ended up, as part of my placement for that, uh, a press association sport. And I was there for a few years. That was, in terms of a racing education, that was perfect. Um, it was a, a really good good group of, of, of lads working there, all, all racing nuts. Um, picked up so much in my time there. And then after... After a few years of doing that, I thought, well, it, 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 it was time to move on and do something else. Um, so I moved into uh, into odds compiling and trading, um, worked for a, a, a few different companies over a, maybe a, a, a four or five, no, no, more, be more than that. That, that would have been 2011 um, when, I, when I first started in compiling. So, from 2011 until 2017, um, I, I was I was in the game, so to speak. Hmm. I, lo I love hearing people's stories into the you know the certain like gambling industry kind of jobs because it's it's rare that you like hear people that say they studied for you know working in the in the betting industry or you know they <clears throat> they really. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just had to go get a degree or something like that. It kind of just seems like almost people fall into these jobs because they they have a hobby. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, for me, obviously, racing w w was huge for me from from when I was from when I was young. It just became more and more important um, as part of my life. Um, it was, but it was really only only when I started on um, on that 
graduate development program for the BHA that that I thought that I would go on to have a career in in racing. And I mean, obviously, working in in betting isn't working in racing, but um, but obviously, it's still closely related. Hmm. And yeah, it's always been a hobby. But when when you're working in your hobby as well, that brings its own challenges at times. Um, you know, there's there's not much switching off from it. Yeah. So uh, describe the first few days or your journey to to working for Camby and what that was like. Well, I I think I started there in 2014. Um, so I'd had a, a, a couple of a couple of years of, of experience prior to that. Um, compi- that was mainly with the compiling um, horse racing, greyhounds, um, trading it as well. I mean, I think I look back on it now, and even from the day I started odds compiling and trading, I knew it was something that that I that I wanted to do, and that, that I was really interested in, and that I was going to enjoy. But I already knew that I, I probably didn't want to do it forever. Although that sounds quite strange, because to a lot of people, I'm sure watching sport particularly horse racing and dogs every day probably sounds like a dream job and to me it was at the time you know i I, I thought this is brilliant but i think i i always had in my mind that i wanted to that i probably wanted to move back into racing at some point i i always particularly in the early days enjoyed compiling enjoyed solving the puzzle really which i I think is 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 what racing is all about as much as the betting side of things and 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 the trading side of things um every race every day is a puzzle that you try to solve um particularly when you're when you're in a in a compiling or trading environment yeah definitely is this was there something i I love asking all my guests this that from the from the other side of the fence was there something that like really shocked you going from you know the I don't know. I guess you assume you did a lot of punting, you know, back in the day or nowadays with horses. Like, is there something that shocked you going to the other side of it? I wouldn't say there was anything that 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 was especially shocking. Um, but a few things certainly surprised me. I think I was surprised at, at just how risk averse everybody was. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I. I I mean, of course, it's a corporate environment and it's a business, but sometimes I just got the impression that, that people had had the life sucked out of them a little bit, um, you know, and, and, and that, I mean, because when I started, which had been in, in 2012, 2011, 2012, um, that was a, a real period of change because that was probably the point when the, the exchanges had, had increasingly started governing prices um you know you 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 couldn't be bigger than the exchange um and also odds checker had come along and odds checker was pretty big um you know it was pretty easy to see who was out of line with who and so to some degree i think this allowed traders and compilers to get a little bit lazy um because they could they could lean on the on the computer lean on the machine to do the job for them uh, mm. to, to some extent at least you know it, 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 it took the pressure off whereas whereas beforehand that they, they'd have had to visit a load of websites to, to see what price people were that they didn't have to do that anymore they, they had it all at, at, at their fingertips but then on the flip side to that so did punters as well um you know they they had betfair and odds checker and armed with those tools there were plenty um who who who, you know who who tried to take advantage of that by they know they no longer had to back their opinion um you know they they had they had betfair and they had odds checker to tell them which way the markets were going to go um and they could use that so it it was it was it it was a two-way thing really i think um that the job was changing but it had to change in line with in line with punters activities you know um, mm. that, that that was and i mean you know that that that's that's probably restrictions and things existed before then but i think probably around 2010 2011 was where where that really started to accelerate um 
I mean, don't get me wrong, the, 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 the people I'm referring to, you know, punters who do, who do just use a machine to, to tell them what to do. Um, I've, I've certainly got no sympathy for, for, for those guys when they complain about being restricted. Um, people often, people often question, oh, well, how do you know? How, how do you know what someone's doing? But it's pretty easy to tell because they all come on at the same time. You know, they all want to back, they all want to back the same horse at the same time um, because the machine's telling everyone the same thing. Um, but yeah, so but it, it did surprise me just how risk averse people were. Um, but yeah, because I, I, I thought that that even even with those things, that there the was scope to be a little bit more bullish. Um, you know, particularly the first place that I worked at, we had a, a good team of compilers there who were, who were very knowledgeable. And, you know, we, we were, were compiling races every day, putting a lot of time into it. But within 20 minutes of those going up, they were pretty much unrecognizable because mm. um, once, once, once the markets had moved, um, and, and, and you expect that, um, you, 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 you do expect that. But then there was no... I just felt there was no real appetite from anybody above to, you know, to be bullish in any way. It was all about fall in line. Um, but yeah, who am I to disagree with that? Because you look at how much money they're making. It's a business and it's very difficult to argue that they're doing it wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 it was I, – I did I did find that interesting. I thought the, the, the risk-averse nature was – expected but a bit more extreme than uh, than i anticipated do, do you think it's the same nowadays like do you think that the you know your canbies whatever they're they're do you think they're not really backing the odds compilers in a way like they're not you know they're not i don't wouldn't say they don't trust them but they'd rather I'll just fall in line like you said with um with racing i don't think there are compilers anymore um i i don't think there are many i don't think there are many firms that are compiling odds now um and probably with good reason because it's it's a waste of their resources really um you know if you've got if you've got a group of lads that are spending three four hours sharing the races between them for you know for in two days time they're going through they're compiling these odds and then you put them out but then the machine tells you what to do anyway well you might as well have just put up the same as everybody else in the first place um, and i think that's what's happening now um most of the time you'll see bet 365 are, are, are the first out um the night before closely followed by by the others um, william hill are up usually pretty quickly um and then everybody else just falls in line really um the exchanges don't don't there wouldn't really be much liquidity in them the the night before um so they don't really come into play until until the day of racing but yeah ev everyone everyone tends to fall in line with each other uh and when that's the case and the number of events as well it, it is is key with that um i mean today i think we had maybe 20 24 maybe 24 25 horse races um probably 135 140 greyhound races um that's an awful lot to yeah. be, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, perhaps not the horse racing. You know that that could be, but you, 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 there's only there's only so much so much resources you can put into that, um, and consequently, I, I, yeah, I don't I don't think um, I don't I don't think there's many firms that will be compiling odds now. Hmm. Yeah, I know. I, it was a similar thing. We had a guy called Anthony Kaminskas on the podcast mm. a couple of months ago, and yeah, I'll get to that towards the later in the podcast. But yeah, he was basically saying that was one of the things that about racing, or at least greyhounds. He was saying nowadays that he don't. Yeah, he basically believes it's not. You know, it's not compiled because there's just so many, so many races on. Um, so what if i mean i i'm sure it's different for both horses and greyhounds but when you were compiling <clears throat> sorry when you were compiling was there a i guess a worse nightmare for in in both uh, in both sports i think i probably came along at the right time where even if you in terms of the the compiling side of things and the trading side of things was th there's there's only really so much that you can get wrong uh, because there's procedures in place that can, you know, that can then intervene when 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 it 
it becomes apparent that that's the case you know you'll have a a, a race in for a certain amount and but once once that hits a certain threshold then you'll receive a notification to tell you that you need to do something about it um so in terms of compiling a race not so much really um i think a lot of people would probably would probably mention multiples at this stage um and you know obviously it depends who the multiples from um you know, <laughs> exactly it, <laughs> if you've got um you know if if, if if it's someone coming on every day to have their lucky 15 well obviously that's that's something that, that bookmakers are going to encourage um but then you know if it's pretty shrewd money um then yeah that 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 would be something that 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 might be a concern um but then i think that's where the knowledge comes in that's where you need a knowledgeable team you need knowledgeable compilers or traders to to be able to preempt that and see it coming um because i mean it, it is possible you know if 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 you sit there and look most things are usually in black and white if you look hard enough um and i think that that's probably tougher now because i don't think i think there are probably a lot of people going into the job now who perhaps don't don't have that knowledge um because they've never they've never really you know they've never really needed it uh, their betting experience will come from perhaps liking a horse seeing who's the biggest price on odds checker and backing it um you know i'm not sure there are many people who now are going into trading or odds compiling who have who have a background in in the sport speaking more specifically about um about racing uh, and, and greyhounds here but then firms probably don't need the most of the time they don't they don't really need that because yeah a, a lot because most of the time there's there's a machine to tell people what to do so i think it's it, it, it's become a lot more data input orientated now um rather than you know rather than knowledge or or, or trade and opinion in any way um which is fair enough you know, you, you've got to move with the times um and, and that's what that's what companies have done um and th- there's there's no arguing with that when you look at you know when you look at their bottom line yeah no it's interesting what you said about the multiples because anthony said the exact same thing about how that's like a good you know, a good multiple bit is what keeps, you know, your bosses up late at night or keeps you in trouble. Sorry, I just might have lost my camera here. Oh, and she's back. This is uh, <laughs> it's a bit of DIY stuff, but uh, I, think, I think that's um, right. Um, but you know, I, I think I think that is right. But then I think it's it's it weird. It's weird, isn't really. it? Because that's like the, you know, that's the number one thing that a bookmaker promotes. Based or you, you know, your standard soft bookmaker. That's you know your bet 365 can be you know the list goes on that's what they want people to do so i just find it uh really interesting that's also the other thing that keeps them up late at night so i'm wondering if that's probably do you think that's just a horse racing greyhound kind of thing probably um i'm probably more racing um than more horse racing than um than greyhounds uh, because obviously your, your, your limits on greyhounds would be would, would would be much lower um but obviously that's in line with the amount of turnover on the sport relative to to horse racing um but yeah i think it, it, it's it is an interesting one um it it's few and far between as well um you know it, it's not like it's not like you have shrewd multiples where someone's line three or four horses up you know that's not happening every week you're talking about every few years here um but i think again that it shouldn't be underestimated how important those are um because i mean you you look at you look at some companies and how much they 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 claim to lose on um the the barney curly coup in 2014 for example um and you think that, that that's that's not an insignificant amount of money, you know that that that's quite a hit. Um, and I, I just think that's where you really need a knowledgeable team um, that can either preempt that or at the very least spot it early. And yeah, I mean, fortunately, we did. 
I, I just, yeah, I, I think in future, that's that, that's probably going to be where we hear most bookmakers horror stories will be you know on multiples because ultimately there's 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 only, there's only so much can win it's only only so much somebody can win betting singles um yeah that that's that's very much under control um and i don't think i don't think that's that's going to stress anybody out i think the the multiples would um but it depends who they're from and i think as long as you've got a, a knowledgeable team, it, it, should, it really shouldn't be something that uh, that catches you on a worse. Yeah, do, do you think there are many inefficiencies in the in the horse racing market, mate? Inefficiencies, um, I suppose. Now, I'd say that that the inefficiencies there are have probably come from either the lack of e- either a lack of knowledge um on on behalf of a, 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 of a trading or compiling team uh, which isn't which isn't necessarily their fault or or actually that it's gone the other way and automation is in is in some instances um causing some inefficiency and for example uh I pay quite a lot, quite a lot of attention now to um, to the U.S. racing and specifically Gulfstream. Um, I, 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 I watch a lot of it um, and I, I'm monitoring the markets from when they go up. Uh, and I, I, I noticed for a few months back that a couple of the firms had started um, automating their prices so that they they were following. Um, the odds that other companies were putting up and finding a, a, a median or average price. But then with things like o- over there, if a race is no longer able to be run on turf, it will be switched to dirt. And I was noticing that quite often one of the one of the firms that they were tracking wasn't really changing their prices. Um, you know, when they were changing over from, obviously it's a completely different race. Once you change from, um, from running a race on turf to running a race on dirt, you've got a completely different race. Yeah. But one of the firms d- d- didn't really seem to be taking that into account. Yeah. Yet, yet these two firms who are who who are tracking their who are tracking their odds are, are then end up chasing a horse out from eight to one to twenty five to one because this firm's thirty three to one when really in the first place their eight to one was too big. You know, and, and, and you think well that 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 completely comes from from automation um and from from a lack of human input uh but then on the flip side i suppose automation also saves a lot of work saves on a lot of resources as well um so it probably balances out i think bookmakers now um if if there's anything if there's anything which is going to make them more money, that's what they'll do. Um, so yeah. you know, they, they they have plenty of people to analyze and iron out any inefficiencies. And I think if there are any, they're probably found and dispatched pretty quickly. But I guess it's a good thing if they don't care. If at the end of the day their books are going to look good and it's all balanced and, you know, they've made some coin, then you know, it's probably, it's good for us because then we can, you know, still go ahead and exploit it. Do you, is there an easy way, do you think, to pick up on the, ineffic- uh, the sorry, the automation inefficiencies? Like, is it is it when it's just, like, so ridiculous, if you know what I mean? That- I think it depends uh, because to some, on the one hand, I think, well, hang on, if you're using automation and I bet, you know, and I take advantage of that. Do 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 I then deserve to either be restricted or lose my account? And I think, well, probably. But I'd I'd take that on the chin much more if if it was you know if I was playing a human at that. Um, I almost think, well, hang on, you, you you're automating your prices based on based on what somebody else is, and you've taken the you know your your program, whatever program you put in place, your algorithm is has made that price bigger 
Um, you know, that, and I think that that's something that is, is a bit of a tightrope, really. So it's not something that, that, that I can that you can really exploit. Um, certainly, I wouldn't um, just because quite often getting a bet on is difficult enough as it is, um, you know, without without taking advantage of what is essentially a rick. But yeah, I, 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 it, it can be done. Um, it just depends whether, you know, whether you're willing to lose your accounts in the process, I suppose. Yeah, and, and on to the Greyhound side of it, because Anthony, I mean, he basically said, like I said earlier, that he doesn't think that there's any compilers doing Greyhounds anymore. I think he said maybe there's one or two. Um, mm. But he said, you know, you can basically set up a Greyhound market, pay no attention to it, and because there's so much dumb money and, the, you know, the margins are so high, um, yeah, you can basically just leave it alone and... Uh, and make a lot of money from the bookmaker side of things. I wouldn't be so sure. Um, I think, yeah, if you've if you've closed everybody who might win, then then yeah, of course you can you you, can, you when you when you price up a race to four or five percent a runner as, as as we you know as we quite often see um, early in the morning, then really you've got a significant amount of margin in your favour. But I I still think with greyhound racing, if you're if you if you're going to price it up, and you're going to let everybody have whatever they want, you know, so so anyone can go on and they can have whatever they want, and you don't restrict anyone, and you let people play, then even even if you're pricing at four percent a runner, you 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 will not win, um, you know, you, you just you can't win. Um, because people will know more about it than you, um, the bookmaker that is. Mm. Uh, so yeah, you, you can you can put it up and not pay any attention to it if you're just closing everybody who's any good. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that maybe that is is the maybe that is the way a lot of companies go. Um, it certainly wasn't what what we tried to do. Um, don't get me wrong, we always we restricted people absolutely we did um but at least tried to lay some kind of bet um wherever we could but again the greyhound greyhound betting has changed quite a lot uh, over here since i started in, in in 2011 because when i started back then there were very very few greyhound races priced up um Unless a race, unless a meeting was on Sky, which was probably on average once a fortnight, once every three weeks, um, then nothing got priced up. So you you either took SP starting price, or you waited until the show a few minutes before the race and, and took whatever price was available then. And that they were your only options. Um, but then Racing Post Greyhound TV came along in probably halfway through 2011 maybe 2012 and th so, so then those races you know people started to price those races up and it, it's built back up from there and now you, you get you know quite a few firms will have um will have the morning races priced up by by mid-morning and the afternoon races generally priced up by early afternoon um that's a good thing. It obviously shows people are looking at the markets, but but yeah, I, I I certainly wouldn't say they could be. I wouldn't say they could be left unattended, um, unless of course you were just taking a dim view of anybody who um, who might win. Uh, in which case, yeah, you can probably just slash them and, and 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 leave the market as it is. But yeah, if if you leave a market without changing any prices and let people have what they want. I, I I I don't think your greyhound department would last too long. <laughs> yeah, no, that was very interesting, mate. Um, do you, I assume you're speaking from a UK perspective? But do you think maybe there's more uh, like effort put into it on other sides of the the world? I mean, I think of like Australia now; they've got the the new mm. betting minimum yeah. minimum bet laws. Mm. So I'm thinking that. There's just there's surely there's absolutely no chance that that they're just you know leaving it unattended if you know what I mean. No, no, absolutely. Um, I think in terms of so speaking from a, a, a greyhounds perspective, um, I think the 
is well it, it's quite clear that australia is just light years ahead of where we are um yeah yeah you, you look at you look at the sport the way it's promoted um everything about it from you know from, from from what's happening on the track to what's happening in trading rooms is is it's just advanced of to, to what we've got uh, the way the sport's funded um it's just it's a much bigger thing um and i i think that's a shame i think there's there's, there's so much more that that we can do um with the sport but it, it, it's pretty difficult because you know funding levels are are not great um and and bookmakers are in no small part responsible for that as well uh because that's you know that, that's the main funding source that that, that that we have um something does need to be done about it um i, I can see that that tracks and promoters and stuff that they, they are between a rock and a hard place to some degree especially at the moment um but yeah it, it's it's quite a tough time um and it, it sounds ridiculous but for, for at the moment it's almost like survival is seen as a bonus you know mm, yeah as far as as far as, uh, as far as greyhound tracks and the yeah. greyhound industry go particularly you know in, in current times with with covid and, uh, yeah. and the way things are at the moment and and finding an edge in these kind of you know in horse racing let's just say is there any if you know if you're sitting there trying to build some whiz bang model you know looking at all the data you know statistics in the world is there what do you think like the most important statistics to look at i mean i assume that both the you know both sides of the fence are going to be looking at them anyway but do you think there's any ones that maybe the bookmaker doesn't think of when they put up their opening prices probably not um <laughs> and if there is then 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 yeah then then the price probably won't won't last long um i think there's obviously a, a, a million different ways that people bet and you know a million different ways that people look at markets um some people will will, will try and bet on every race every day and or, you know that, that that's going to be very difficult um i think the way to do it rather than you know, rather, some people will use stats don't get me wrong some people are using sectional times um you know but some people will be using jockey and trainer stats and uh you know horse stats over different trips and things like that um i know there's the, the, there's there's a couple of databases out there that people use and they'll go on trends and uh, uh, the, there's any number of ways to try to pick a winner um but i think if you know if there's a way to identify I, th I think identifying value is the key and it depends on on how you do that uh obviously the more knowledgeable you are the easier it is to do you know if if, if the more up to date you are with all of the participants in a race the easier you will find it to to kind of put those in an order you know to have those in an order in your head of, of, of where you of of what percentage chance really they have of of winning the race um and then you you determine from that whether whether you perceive that that their odds are relative to that chance or whether they underestimate it with so many races every day i think you if if you're serious about it in any way you you have to specialize um yeah. you have to you have to you know limit the amount of, of of stuff that you're looking at and you can restrict that any 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 way you like really um i think you know, some people will will, will like try to specialize in sprints or those in, in in long distance stuff um and i think you you, you, ha you have to specialize you have to you have to know what your bread and butter is you have to know where your edge is um but that's your edge it, an edge isn't just going to come you know it's not just going to come along you, you, you're only going to get that out of hard work um you know through watching racing or or through through finding something that works for you um you know you, 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 it's impossible with racing to just pick up a paper one day and have an edge you know to look at a race card and, and go oh well yeah you know I, I, 
and, and just be able, yeah, you could fluke it, sure, and and, and pick out a couple of winners. Uh, but that's that that that's not an edge; that's a guess. Um, and I think that you have to identify what you do well, and and focus on that. Um, know what your bread and butter is, know what you do well, which which isn't to say that you can't bet on anything else. You know, if there's something that stands out to you, then then yeah, you can. Um but you know, and you always have to be prepared to change as well because you have to be realistic and realize that your edge probably isn't gonna last forever. Um and and, and you know and you may have to to, to move from one thing to another or or to tweak it slightly um another thing that, I, that i'd say is it, it is to be careful who you listen to um when when trying to you know when trying to get that edge there's a lot of people out there who who will suggest that they've got the answers um and if they did have them uh, why would they be telling you? Um, I, 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 but also, you know, so, don't get me wrong. There are some, there are some decent tipsters out there, um, you know, who 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 do it to make a few quid, um, and and they do a decent job. Uh, but but there are also plenty of people out there who who will will give off the impression that, that they know what they're doing um, and that that they have an edge which can benefit you. I'd be, I'd be very wary of that. I think it, it's important to to be careful who you listen to. Um, some people would say don't listen to anyone else. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably quite naive. Um, you you have to be open to different ideas and different suggestions. Um, but yeah, always with a realization or an acknowledgement of of where they're coming from, and don't cash out. <laughs> as well <laughs> would be another one that, that, that i would say it really winds me up you know um yeah, you'll see uh, that there, there's loads of good twitter accounts by the way picking up on what i've just said as well about about um about people tipping stuff there's there's thousands upon thousands of bad ones but there are good ones out there and i think michael verity touched on this as well um a couple of weeks back when uh, when when you spoke with him um that yeah, if if you're selective about that, then you can you can you can find some quite decent information on there. Uh, but yeah, I, the the cash out thing it winds me up when you go on Twitter and people go, "Oh, should I cash out or should I not?" Like, well, you've done a fourfold. If you're thinking about cashing out, just do a treble next time. Yeah. You know, you, you, when you had the bet, this was the situation that you wanted to be in. Why would you relinquish that? Um, and a cash out is never value. If it was, they wouldn't be offering it you. Uh, mm. so, yeah, I think that, that that's that, that's one thing that I would say. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, the edge is crucial. Know what you're good at, um, and if you're not good at anything, then uh, fair enough. Some people will bet just for fun. I think the majority of people who do bet bet for fun. Um, and that's that's good. Obviously, anyone, even people who are betting seriously, if 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 it's not fun, don't do it. Um, but I think if if you have any intention of 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 making it pay, even to the smallest degree, then you're going to need to specialise. You're going to need discipline, um, and you're going to need to to know what you're good at and 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 try to capitalise on that. Yeah, no, I, love, I love the cash out talk, but the only the only time where I feel like cash out might make sense is if you know you've had maybe a a futures bet or something like that, and you know, mm. like your typical example, like Leicester City to win the league and stuff like that. If you've had, I mean, imagine if you'd had a couple hundred dollars on that, and it's getting into the mm. last couple of weeks, and the cash out options for a couple hundred grand, you'd yeah. be like, that's pretty hard to to forego. <laughs> no, I, 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 I mean. You- I think when you're when you're talking about uh, you can un- you can kind of understand when you're talking about a life changing sort yeah. of thing. <laughs> you know? um, but it, ultimately, yeah. I in general, yeah, you're in 100%. general. It's and even then, even then, if you cash it out, even if it's for a life changing sum of money, it's still not value. No, it's um, 
I could understand why someone would do it. It might be valuable. But... <laughs> it might be valuable, yeah. yeah. Um, and then at least at least if it wins, you know, well, yeah, you've given some money back, but at least you can, you know, you can you can drown your sorrows in some expensive whiskey. <laughs> or something, you know? uh, uh, yeah, I, I I can see why people would do it in you know in a, in an extreme circumstance where where they get into a situation that was beyond what they could have imagined when they had the the speculative bet. Yeah. Yeah. And mate, nowadays you're working for Rip and Race Course. Uh, I mean, you've told me that you're doing, you've done various roles over the years, but in general, how's the, how's it all going? Because I imagine it must be a pretty tough time at the moment for, you know, for race horse or race courses, sorry. Yeah, very much so. Um, this year has been particularly tough. Um, we, we lost a couple of fixtures um, due to, you know, due to the season being cut short. We missed a couple of months from March through, well, from mid March through to June, um, which took which took a couple of our fixtures out. And then even when racing did return, uh, we 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 didn't have any crowds. So, yeah, it's been it, it's been a pretty tough year. Um, our season finished in September, and we're planning for next year now. Um, putting putting everything in place for that but it's really difficult to plan when you know yeah we've got we've got a, a vaccine that's being rolled out at the moment but we've got this tier system that we, we, we don't we have no idea what the situation is going to look like come mm. april um so we're trying to put some tickets on sale at the moment uh which is proving quite difficult um you know with with all the restrictions that we have but yeah, we're we're hoping for a much better 2021 than than we had 2020. But that's going to go for pretty much everyone who's involved in in the sports or or leisure industry. I think um, we're not we're not the only ones that that's hoping for that. But you know, you you do hope that having been starved of attending sporting events for the best part of the last 12 months or it certainly will be that by the time we come around to racing again in april that uh, that people will be will be raring to to get themselves along to the races for a day out um yeah, yeah it, it it really was depressing i mean racing behind closed doors uh, it, it it served a purpose and and, I, I, and you know we, we certainly wouldn't complain about it because it, it it's it's helped us hugely uh but racing is is not designed to be you know to, to be run behind closed doors it's designed for for people to to come and enjoy themselves and and that, that's what we'll be aiming for next year from a betting perspective do you think it's it negatively or positively impacts because i mean you've got your on-course bookies who are obviously out of you know out of business i mean a lot of them well, while, while these restrictions are in place so do you think it affects punters negatively or positively um you you really feel for the for the on course guys um you know yeah a, a lot of them a lot of them pro probably will go out of business um because of it and they're, I'm 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 from you know from the public. Pro most of them probably won't get a hell of a lot of sympathy either, because bookmakers, by and large, are you know that they're, they're not. Nobody feels sorry for them, do they? Um, and I, I, I think, well, I, I, yeah, it, it it really is a shame. Um, they've they've been hit particularly hard, um, probably harder than anybody else in in the racing industry, really. Uh, Punters, it's hard to say. Um, I think certainly in the early stages when racing returned, I think there was probably quite a boom in, you know, in, in, in betting because you still had quite a lot of people at home either locked down or working from home or, you know, working part time or, or, or whatever who, who were looking for things to do. And at that time, there wasn't a hell of a lot to do. Uh, you know, I think foot, football did come back uh, very shortly after racing, but people had had months of uh, of, of either watching US racing uh, or Belarusian football, and 
by the time racing came back around, I think people were were really keen just to have something that they could get their teeth into. Um, so I think probably for the first few days after racing came back, I I, I don't have any figures um, because I, I I I don't work for for bookmakers anymore. But it, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, if those figures were pretty hefty for for those mm-hmm. first few days after after racing came back. I think since then. It's hard to say. Um, I think punters have have probably engaged with racing more because because there's been less on. Um, but I think as things have come back, it's probably just just reverted to to normal levels, really. Yeah. Okay. I think I think the Belarusian football things the the funniest thing that's come out of COVID. I mean, they have to oh be the most word. used. They have to be the most <laughs> used and abused league of all time. Like everyone yeah. was like for. What was it maybe a month or two? Like everyone was like watching Belarusian football this weekend, and people are doing previews. Everyone was picking a team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, and, and now people it's were just like previews. They had no idea who the teams were. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it was. It was uh, I think I the season was... just finished. I think it just. I think I saw a tweet about it or something like that, and I was like, yeah. Fuck. I remember when everyone it? was talking about it. But did you see the end of the season? No, what no, happened I mean, at the end of, at the, end of the season? Oh, it was it was it was a cracking finish. <laughs> um, it was Barte. Um, Barte needed a win, I think, or they needed to better Shakhtar Soligorsk's result on the last day of the season. And Barte drew nil nil, and Shakhtar Soligorsk won, but with two goals in stoppage time. Oh wow! Um, so, yeah, so they basically won the league in stoppage time. It's like Man uh, City yeah. stuff. Oh, it was, it was, it was huge. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was massive in Belarus. Um, you know, it, it, it passed me by a little bit at the time, but um, yeah, when someone brought my attention to it, I, I, it did. Yeah, like like you, it, it, it dragged my mind back to um, to March and April and miserable days of watching the likes of Belshina, Bobruisk, and Slavia Mozia try to kick a ball around. <laughs> yeah, was, That's yeah. when you know we're in a pandemic, mate. It is, it is, yeah. Um, and the worst thing is, as well, you'd start to look forward to it, wouldn't you? Oh, <laughs> the football's on in a minute. Was the, some, some, some of the most dreadful fare I've ever seen, which is no respect to the, you know, disrespect to um, to the Belarusian league. But uh, yeah, I think some of the some of the games that I saw will not live long in the memory. It's fair to say. Certainly not, mate. Um, mate, a couple of just general questions before we uh, before we call it a day. What you know, being from the other side of the fence and spent a lot of time there, is there one thing that you'd like to see change in the gambling industry? I think I'd like to see some kind of minimum bet come in over here, like you have um, recently had introduced over there. Uh, I think that is a good move. However, I can also see why that's not really possible because if you, if you're given a minimum bet to people who are, you know, who are taking the mick, um, then the, well, they don't deserve a minimum bet. Oh, this yeah. is okay. I can't they hear you anymore. It. No, any better? Oh, there we go. That's better. Yeah. What happened there? Don't I know. lost you completely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's probably not a bad thing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the with, with with the minimum bet, I, I can see why why bookmakers would be reluctant to bring it in because ultimately there are plenty of people out there who who don't deserve one, um, you know, and they're they're closed for a reason and they deserve to be closed or restricted to pennies, um, and to give them a minimum bet would 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 just be silly. But yeah, I think that that, that there's probably something that can be done in that regard. Uh, I. I I would be concerned about levels of automation now. Um, I think it's probably got to a point where, where where humans probably can be replaced in some circumstances by by computer programs, um, and and that's that's obviously quite worrying um, for the people who are working in the industry. And I'm not one of them, but it has been something I think that, that has been that's been coming for for a little while there's most people will probably will probably talk about 
most people who aren't on the bookmaker side of the fence will probably talk about restrictions and they'd say, oh, you know, there, 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 there should be less restrictions. But ultimately, that they've got a business to run. Um, and when when their business is making money, they're, they're probably not going to, you know, they're probably not going to change the way that they do that. Um, you look at, I mean, people might say, oh, but they, but they have people who are losing a lot of money. So why why can't people win i mean I, I i think i think there should be it should be accepted that punters are allowed to win providing they play for, you know providing they play fair um you know I, I, and there are firms out there who who do that um you know that they're, they're not averse to punters winning and they won't close punters for winning um and i think that i think that's right but i think a lot of the time now the way the way firms will go about it is to you know they'll run a report at the end of the day that'll tell them who's won it'll tell them what price they got at the start of the day and it'll tell them what price the horse went off but well that doesn't really give you the information that you need does it um because that price the price that they took and the price that it went off well there could be seven hours between those two so so what time did it move you know is is that something that you can use or you know have have they followed but if they, if they've just been following everyone else then that's something that you should have picked up at the time um you know you shouldn't be punishing them for that at the end of the day um i, I think there's a balance there but yeah it, it it is a tough one um people shouldn't be people shouldn't be closed for winning although obviously you can understand them being restricted um but then there are there are in the vast majority of cases, I think accounts that get closed do deserve to be closed. Hmm. Okay. I, I, I kind of get the feeling nowadays that, I mean, when you first kind of come into the industry, you're like, oh, screw the bookmakers for limiting accounts, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, once you talk to enough people in the industry, you realise that it's, it is a business. And just like any business, you're not going to keep, you know, bookmaker or keep up. Uh, gamblers accounts open just because uh you think it's the right thing to do i think you're just always concerned about your bottom line so i've kind of nowadays i've more so just thought like we shouldn't really be we should be targeting our efforts or our voices towards regulators and you know governments and these kind of bodies because they're the ones who could actually make a difference yeah 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 absolutely um I, you know it, it's if you're if you're standing in the pub and someone comes up to you and, and 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 says they want a certain amount on a horse well you're going to want to know who they are before you you know before you decide whether whether you want to give them that bet or not aren't you um and then if it wins you're probably going to be a little bit more cautious the next time that goes without saying um and uh, you know that that that's the way that's the way bookmakers started off um you know that, that that will have happened back in the day that's not something that's new but now it's just on on a much wider scale um and you know it's it, it, it's it's much bigger business and i think that it, it, the industry has just has moved with the times um one thing that does surprise me though is quite a lot of you know there, there are a lot of people who, who've been in the industry for quite a long time and i'm convinced that if i was born 10 15 years earlier i'd be retired by now because you think that they had the best of everything, you know, <laughs> they had um, the exchanges came along. They had, you know, they had the benefit of, of, of early markets with that. Um, you know, you look at, at people who, who, who had all day to look at stuff at, at the best possible time. There was so much to take advantage of, particularly during the 2000s, I think, you know, from from 2000 up to, you know, 2010, possibly even a little bit before that. And, and there's so many people who, who work in the industry. And I just think, what were you doing? Like, what, surely you could have, surely you could have made that pay more. Um, but, you know, maybe that maybe that goes back to uh, back to what I've said at the start about um, about risk averseness. Maybe they've just always been like that. Mm. No, great points, mate. I've uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you and uh, 
yeah, hopefully the listeners enjoy getting a bit more insight into the – we haven't had too many people on, maybe one or two others talk about the horse racing or greyhound side of things. So I think you gave some, uh, yeah, some really good insight into that side of the, the betting world. So, mate, thanks for coming on and can you just let Cheers, people mate. know where they can find you and, and your work too? Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, uh, I I suppose I should – I don't know. What is my – what's my Twitter thing? I, I don't <laughs> – I don't know. I don't tweet myself. Um, I, I can try to look it up for you if you want, mate. If, if, um, oh, if I look go. at it, yeah, it's John John Mullen underscore eighty four. There we go, John Mullen underscore eighty four. Yeah, um, that, that that's that's the one. Um, yeah, you can you can you can find me there and my. Well, no, but nobody needs my opinions, but uh, but but if you want them, then, uh, then yeah, that's where to find them. All right. Terrific, mate. Um, And for the listeners wondering what podcast we might have coming next, I would assume this will come out on a Monday, so we should have a preview of the last UFC card of the year a couple days after that Monday. So that should be the next podcast coming up. But thanks for listening, everyone. Please do a quick rate and review of the podcast. Share it around to your friends. Subscribe to us. Just tell the world all about us. Uh, And if you're looking to implement some of the strategies we talked about today, obviously not horse racing ones or greyhounds because we haven't got that in the software yet. But if you want to do a bit of value betting on all sorts of sports, go and start a free week trial of Trade Mate Sports. Jonathan, mate, thank you once again. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, guys. See ya.